Well, he was no. He, he was, was never put in jail, for instance. No, he never lost his. But job. he was a uh, uh, his his uh, um, research was characterized as research. It was not uh, interpreted to be dogma. Okay. And thus, uh, it was fine. Get, he was doing text. science, and that's yeah. what the church wanted. Do and science. People generally ignored him, I believe, as a, as a culture. Well, the consequence of, of adopting him and adopting Galileo's perceptions mm -hmm. is to undermine uh, the, the acceptance of scripture. Yeah. But it wasn't just the church. People often blame the church. It was a societal belief system. It was beyond the church. Just oh, like HIV and AIDS. There, was a ready, there had to be a readiness to accept it on yep. the part of a lot of people. Yep. And that, no. can be, that, that can be attributed to a number of things. But, but, but ultimately, uh, the, the church sponsored Galileo, and they sponsored uh, Copernicus. Mm -hmm. They were behind the science. Mm -hmm. And when they said to Galileo, you have gone past science, you're trying to lecture us in theology, and that's not your competence. And also, he was very successful in his school. Didn't he have his own school teaching all these people? I think, I, I could well, be wrong about this. he had following. He did. He had following. And, and yeah. I think that he had much more influence than Copernicus, and that's why he was more threatening. Um, but he wasn't only threatening to the church. A lot of people didn't want to hear what he had to say. Well, a lot of people were threatened by the when their worldview was challenged. The society as a whole did not like it. No, well, definitely not. I, if if love is the most uh, powerful force in the universe, the second most powerful uh, force in the universe is, is um, inertia. <laughs> you threaten <laughs> someone's <laughs> perspectives and they'll say, no, that means I have to formulate a whole new set of habits, and that's hard work. Yeah. But how my habits get me through the day. Right. Leave, please. I don't want to hear any more. Yes, it's too much. Um, one of the people that uh, wrote a book about this, Peter Duisberg, is a famous sort of HIV reappraiser. Um, and he wrote a fantastic book not just because he talked about HIV and AIDS. Um, I think he tends to blame the drugs too much for the causes of illness, the anti-HIV drugs. He tends to say if a person gets sick and dies, that's why. And I've seen that that's not always the case. However, I don't know why they do. I, I, I tend to believe that if HIV is not a, an accurate test, if the viral load test is not an accurate test for HIV virus attacking you, it still could be a non-specific test for something um, that could be wrong with your system. I don't want to say every single person with HIV is going to die. I don't believe that's true. I, I mentioned my patient, right, as an example who counters that belief. Although, you know, whatever, he's still got another 20 years to go before he could disprove it. Because the whole thing started in the 80s, right? We're only 20 years out. So, you know, how can you disprove something that's supposed to kill you until you live to be 80? And that's going to take him quite a while. I think it was Duisburg, I think it was Duisburg, who went to Africa and convinced one of the African chiefs. Sort of Not a chieftain, president of South Africa. That the whole thing was wrong. And yeah. But that way it seems oh, that, yeah. that president yeah. Duisburg is still around. He's still doing research. He got he got hit so hard for the AIDS and HIV. He lost all his um, grants. I think he had for something like five years. He he, he had had he was a, he was a brilliant researcher and favorite of the funding agencies for funding his research, which was in retroviruses. And he had something like every grant field he ever requested up until he started to question HIV and AIDS. And that was about a 15-year research career. And then after that, after that, he went public with some of his, because um, he was still publishing widely, and he published critiques of HIV and AIDS starting in 1987, not that far after they first came up with the whole thing. And um, after that, he had every grant refused for something like five years. And the only reason he was still able to do research was because he had a seven-year grant which is very rare. Not very many people get a grant to fund the research which will pay you for seven years. That's a given only to kind of the elite researchers, really. Of course, that one didn't get renewed. When that ran out, um, a private funder, kind of thing, an alumnus from the university where he teaches, which is Berkeley, you see Berkeley, funded his research. That's the only reason he can still do any research at all. <laughs> and he kind of moved away from HIV and AIDS. He felt like, you know, what's the point in a sense? Um, and he's, he, he had always been really a cancer researcher. His whole area was retroviruses and cancer. He finally decided they didn't cause cancer. And that's another reason he got in trouble, because it was the leading elite of retrovirology. We're all arguing these various lines that it could. However, when AIDS came along, his book talks about this very well, they all had a new lease on life. 
Because their cancer hypotheses could now be abandoned, they weren't working, and they had something new. And these were not small people, these were powerful people. Um, the retrovirologists were the leaders of the cancer, the war on cancer. Who was this? Uh, doctor? The book, the book is called Inventing the AIDS Virus by Peter Duisberg, D-U-E-S-B-E-R-G. You could get it at a website, probably you could get it at a website called um, bookbinder.com. It's out of print. If you can't find it, I have some extra copies. Inventing when the I found AIDS it, it was going out of print, they had, you know, I was in these links, so somebody said, you know, you can get 20 copies of it. <laughs> So I think I got 10 copies back then. I think I still have a few of them, right? Yeah. Um, it, the other thing, I, the, before I leave that, the reason I got into the whole topic of him was because of the societal belief system issue. Before he even gets into HIV and AIDS, he goes into these other false epidemics. Um, scurvy was a classic one. You guys probably know this, maybe you don't. Scurvy was believed to be an infectious disease forever. You know how sailors were quarantined? Yeah. Maybe you've heard that story. Always quarantined, and sometimes they would be abandoned. They came across the desert. And one of the humorous stories that Duisburg recounts is a guy who was abandoned on a tropical island. And then they came back a few months later and he was doing <laughs> great because <laughs> the tropical island was rich in things they didn't have on ship. How did the Brits get named Limey? There you go. The solution to the problem. Yes. But another part of the story that only a few people remember, sort of medical historians might remember, is the guy who solved the problem, James Lind, did studies, not first with limes, he did other fruits and vegetables and other foods to see who could recover. He just, he just came up with that it was a nutritional problem and said, let's give him good nutrition. And he did see people recovering very high numbers. Um, and again, I wouldn't say everyone recovered, but a lot of people did. And he eventually came up with the limes too. But his research was rejected. Mm. And it was not until 40 years after his studies that the British um, started including, changed the diet aboard ship. 40 years. Mm. That's a long time. And that isn't even that much of a paradigm shift as I think HIV and AIDS is. That was a paradigm shift of a small nature about one disease which was common aboard ships. But you know. The second most powerful force in the universe. <laughs> yes. We don't do that. That's People not in the book. Yeah. And there's, he goes to other ones like that. Yeah. There's a lot of stories like that that you know, a medical historian might know and nobody else would know. Well, has anyone studied patients like Magic Johnson? Others like that can never survive. Can we study you know them? how they study them? I think you skim the gallons of blood. You know, know how they study them? Research. They look for some mm -hmm. genetic, um, they think they want to find a genetic impermeability. Somebody like Magic Johnson, I don't really know the story of Magic Johnson, so let's say somebody who is a, they call him a long term non progressor. And by the way, that doesn't just mean being healthy, it also means low viral load. If your viral load goes up, you're a progressor. If your CD4 comes, you're a progressor, meaning you've progressed towards AIDS. So it has to be somebody, I always make that distinction because to me it's a big distinction. It has to be somebody who's healthy and the blood tests are good. So if they happen to get an illness like pneumonia, they'd be out. Even if it's a root, I mean, people get pneumonia, right? Or it doesn't have to be pneumonia. There's all these other illnesses that cause low CD4. If they get one of those, they're out. They're not a, according to conventional scientists. So, you do have to be sort of a little bit of an epitome of health to make it into long-term non-progressor status. Um, but what they look for is some genetic mark. They say this person must have something in their genes protecting them. And they look for, like the, you know, you ever heard of the cancer genes they look for that cause cancer? Well, it's like that. They must have some genetic. They don't ever look at lifestyle factors. We contemplated, me and a, a woman, um, starting a little study to see, you know, look at lifestyle factors. But I don't have the energy. So well, I didn't did. try. Yeah. I mean, we talked about it. That's all we did. And she came up with, she was going to make it a project for um, graduate school. But at this point, I think the whole thing is just you know, hmm. going nowhere. Yeah. I mean, I have my patients. My patients are my only guide mm -hmm. to that. And they are an interesting bunch. I'm a magnet. I'm not a good person. I'm not, by no means are my patients a random sample. I'm a magnet for people who are doing well. And also a magnet for people who don't want to take antiretrovirals.